So then I started having chips on my shoulder. I had my own little thing I was doing with a couple guys, working out on my own, doing my own little thing. And when you start doing that stuff, and you start to drive yourself away from people, you know? And I was already different as it was. You know, even if I didn't do that, I already came in being very different. Like I tell people, I was a part of the Navy SEAL teams. But not I wasn't brother. part of the brotherhood. That's not me, that's never been me though. Like if I was in a college, if I was in a big, fr I couldn't be part of a fraternity, man. I would never join a fraternity. That's me, I don't like fraternities. So just me, when you join the SEAL teams, you're joining a big fraternity. So I was already asked out. So then when you're asked out, not wanting to hang out, I do my own shit, that's me. So I, I, I grew up wanting friends at a young age, and once you get self-esteem and shit, you know who you are, I was comfortable, you're not liking me, but I'm not hanging out. And then you take it to another step further with this being hard mentality of if you guys aren't doing what I'm doing, you guys aren't shit. So I did a lot of things that pushed people the wrong way, that rubbed people the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And in that, being in the fraternity, it's like a big soap opera. It's like the fucking guiding light. And you know, People start not liking you for certain reasons. People don't even know who the fuck you are. Rumor mills start happening. Then I have two heart surgeries. People think I don't want to fucking deploy overseas. Oh, goggles don't want to fight. He just wants to run. But I'm not going to say I, I, I had two heart surgeries. I couldn't even go fight. So just a lot of things happen. And w within that, um, it's life. No, me, me looking back on it, it, I was who I wanted to be. I was who I wanted to be. So my goals were finding the baddest men on the planet, working with the baddest guys on the planet. And the heart surgeries hurt me a little bit. Um, but what I realized is I got a lot of growth from examining people. You know, my, my insecurities, their insecurities, my military career was absolutely stellar. You know, not many people have pulled off honor man everywhere I went mm -hmm. and done the things I've done. I didn't deploy as much as I wanted to. Yeah, I went to Iraq, stuff like that, but I wanted to deploy a lot more with, with the heart surgeries, keep me out of training for four years. That hurt me a lot. But all in all, there's not many people who've done some of the things I've done. But anybody that can accomplish anything that is hard, the only separator is, is that they really want to be there. There's some people that get inspired and that inspiration moves them to try to do something. But the inspiration is very high right now in this nice environment. We're in a nice environment, mm -hmm. the ocean's out there. I'm talking to you, if I wanna to go to the fucking refrigerator and get something to drink, mm -hmm. eat, I can. I watched a movie about some badasses, you're inspired. But the second you're not in this environment and you're actually doing what inspired you that suck factor is now real. You can't just get off your fucking couch and get a fucking shake mm -hmm. or get a fucking box of donuts or, or turn the TV or go take a shit or a piss or yeah. go, go get your girlfriend and cuddle up. No, you're now there. And only those people who have been there a million times in their minds and have lived in that water and have suffered a million times and realize my legs may break. My knee may break. My bones will hurt. I will be the coldest I've been in my life. I will be miserable and accept that. Because what happens is when you, when you get in a horrible situation in life, your mind, I call it my one second decision. When you get in a horrible situation in life, your mind immediately says, get the fuck out of here. Everybody does, even if you want to be there. But it starts to have all these different questions mm -hmm. in your mind in that one second. And says, okay, why are you here? Why are you doing this? Why this? Why that? And then you start to say to yourself, if you don't want to be there that bad, I have a beautiful wife at home. How the fuck am I doing this? Like, this is stupid. This is gonna get these guys injured. For, like, like, they're gonna pay for this for the rest of their lives. I'm not gonna break my body up to do this. Your mind starts to say, yeah, this is stupid. But if you have, if you are already knowing that this is gonna to happen to you, you have all the answers to these questions that your mind starts to give you when you're in suffer mode. And that's what I realized. And you have to be there over, but not there at the graduation. 
You got to be there in the worst in the parts suffering. that you know over and over again. If you concentrate solely on your career, you can get a long way in your career. And I would say that that's a strategy that a minority of men preferentially do. That, that's all they do. They work like 70, 80 hours a week. They go flat out on their career. They're staking everything on the small probability of exceptional status in a narrow domain. But it's, it's hard on them. They don't have a life. It's very difficult for them to have a family. They don't know how to take any leisure activity. Like they get very one dimension. Now, it may be that that unidimensionality is the price you have to pay to be exceptional at one thing, right? Because if you're going to be something like a genius level mathematician and you want to do that for, or a scientist say, it's like you're in your lab, you're in your lab all the time, you're working 70 hours a week or 80 hours a week, you're smart, you're dedicated, you're unidimensional, and that's how you get to beat all the other people who are doing that. It's the only way. But the problem is you don't get a life. Now, if you love being a scientist and you have that kind of focus of mind, well, first of all, you're a rare person, and second, you're going to pay for it. But fine, more power to you. But, but it's, a, it's a risky business to do that. You sacrifice a lot for it. You know, and I would say most often, if you're speaking about having a healthy life, that isn't what you do. You spread yourself out more, so you know, you have a family, you have some things that you do outside of work that are meaningful to you and useful. You, you have a network of friends. Um, well, that, that, those three things alone or four things alone are plenty to keep you well oriented. And then if one of those things collapses, you know, everything doesn't go. Now, the, the price you pay for that is the more you strive to optimize that balance, the less likely you are to be fantastically successful at any single one of them. But you might have a very, you know, if you con consider your life as a whole, that might be a winning strategy. One of the things Carl Jung said, I really liked this. He thought that men went after perfection and win women went after wholeness. So they're different, they're different value, they're, di they're different, there's something different at the top of the value hierarchy. So perfection would be stake it all on one thing and, and look for radical success. Not, all, not that all men do that, because they don't, but we're, we're talking about extremes, at, at least with the regards to the men that do that. The wholeness idea is more like, well, I want, I want, it's like I want one thing in my life to be 150%, or I want five things in my life to be 80%. Well, there, there's a lot more richness in a life where you have five things operating at 80%, but you're not operating in any of, at any of them at 150%. So, and I really believe this because I've watched men and women go through their careers now for a long period of time. And one of the things that, there's lots of things that produce this. But one of the things that I've noticed is that mostly women in their 30s bear, bail out of unidimensional careers. They won't do them. They won't, they won't put in the 80 hours a week that they would have to put in in order to dominate that particular area. And it isn't, the reason that they won't do it is because they decide it's not worth it. And no wonder, because why would that be worth it? You, you have to ask yourself that. It's like, well, you want to be an outstanding scientist. It's like, okay, really? Really, that's what you want, because that means that's what you do. Because you're competing with other people, you know, they're smart, they're hardworking, and if you want to be at the top, you have to be smarter and work harder than any of them. And working hard means working long hours. I mean, it also means working diligently, but in, in the final analysis, it's all, also an additive issue. If I'm smart and hardworking and I can crank out for 70 hours a week, and you do it for 30, it's like, in two years, I'm so far ahead of you, you will never, ever catch up. So, anyways. And I think partly, maybe part of the reason, too, that women are oriented that way more than men. I think there's two reasons. Is one is, socioeconomic status does not make women more attractive on the mating market, but it does make men more attractive. And the second is, women's time frame is compressed. Right, because guys can always say, well, I'll have kids later. And they can say that till they're like 80. Whereas women, it's like, no way, man, you gotta, get it, you gotta get it together by the time you're, let's say, 40, but really probably by 35, but definitely by 40. So, the, the re part of the reason you choose your damn sacrifice, because the sacrifice is inevitable, but at least you get to choose it.